Hello, my name is Alexander Mironov. I'm the manager of Electron Microscopy Core Facility in the University of Manchester. Today, I'm presenting another lecture from our seminar series, Wednesday EM Talks, that covers principles and methods of electron microscopy that are used in our facility. Today's topic is correlative light electron microscopy at ease. Need to record this section. I, I forgot to put it on record, but now it's fine. So, what, what we're talking about uh, correlative electron microscopy, and we have a, a load of information already published, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm referring to these um, uh, issues of um, methods in cell biology. Uh, these three volumes, which actually I have in in a um, digital mode, so I can share them if you want. Uh, just uh, send me email and I will share it through the Zend2 uh, uh, service in Manchester University. And also, uh, this several volume, several volumes, they are related to the EMBL courses. And these courses are really, really nice. And I've been on, on, on one uh, of them in 2019 about uh, exactly the correlated flight electron microscopy. And of course, I'll share my experience later on. So, uh, in recent years, in starting from 2000, uh, mid 2004, uh, 5, we have a exponential growth of uh, correlative light microscopy, electron microscopy publications. And uh, uh, as you see, if you just search PubMed, uh, you will get, uh, I think nowadays, much more than 1900 publications. And of course, it's not possible to describe them all. So I'll concentrate on the most uh, <clears throat> Uh, popular at least in, in our environment, and that will be uh, based on papers by Polishuk um, uh, and Mironov and uh, Wanda Kukulski and uh, um, from the Briggs lab. Um, uh, just a second, I need to. Oh, come on. So that's it. So uh, there are those classifications of, of correlative light electron microscopy, and uh, it's understandable why, because in, in general, correlative means that you can combine several things together, and uh, actually nobody limits you to combine things. So it, it's like a preparing a dish. You can put all ingredients known and combine them and see how, how does, does it work. So you have, uh, I think, tens of different classifications, and that is an example, uh, well, it's one of them, uh, which actually uh, classify the methods by probes, and you can see that in many cases the probes could be the same. It could be the, the uh, conjugates of gold with fluorescence marker, it could be the uh, <clears throat> quantum dots, could be the derivatives, derivatives of the uh, peroxidase um, enzyme and uh, the proteins which can convert the light into the electron dense precipitate also uh, of course the fluorescent uh, tags uh, the uh, uh, gfp based tags and uh, all these me methodologies could be uh, <clears throat> employed in different environments like exogenous uh, tags and endogenous tags and a uh, whole variety but myself i would like um, I, I like more the the classification which is based on protocols because I'm more kind of the technical uh, mind man. And even in, in this case, you can see that very often the specific methods they are present in, in both or oh, in, in, in several places, like high pressure freezing, like chemical fixation, you can see them in there and here. You can see these uh, the cryo part in several cases, you can see monolabeling on, on the sections, you can see the uh, embedding, embedding in special resins like low acryls. So actually it's, it's that just, you know, again, as I said, it's a combination of many known things and the, the idea is to get something new, to get the, the, uh, uh, the power up. If you combine several things, you can get much more than just the sum, sum of two things. So that, that's my uh, favorite um, uh, classification because it actually shows uh, it's not just letters, not just words, uh, which we need to remember what is what. Uh, it shows in, in a diagrammatic way uh, what is possible and most of things which we can do, it relates uh, in, in the middle part uh, where we can 
to uh, chemical fixation, high pressure freezing, using several methodologies to go to the uh, block which could be frozen or could be embedded in the, into the resin, and then it could be cut on sections and investigated by uh, scanning electron microscopy, transmission electron micro microscopy. In the case of uh, cryo, in, in case of low temperature, of course, you need to use cryotium. And that's a scheme I, I took from uh, this EMBL LAM course in 2019, which I really, really like. So uh, let's do uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> review of the first um, method. Uh, it's called, by, by, for me, it was a bit surprising because people usually call it, especially on that, on that course, Luini method. But if you go to the original publication, uh, actually, the first author is Robin Polishuk, and the uh, <clears throat> last author is uh, my father, actually. And I, I was working together, together with them um, roughly in, in time when this method was developed. And uh, Alberto Luini was just a, was, was a head, very good, very good scientist, biochemist. He, he was a, a head of a big lab, um, and he was supervising the work of both Roman and, and my father. But the thing is that he was not electron microscopist at all. So I think it will be more uh, proper to call it probably Mironov method or Polishuk Mironov method. Uh, but the thing, of course, that uh, uh, sometimes Russian surnames are not very well, not very, do not sound very well in, in English. <clears throat> uh, so I, I just not decided yet. So I don't know how to call it. So I'll put it in this way. Uh, the idea is that. Uh, uh, you actually use special um, petri dishes with a special cover slip, which is gridded. And grid is just embedded. No, it's not embedded. It's, it's a, <clears throat> uh, etched, uh, chemically etched. So you have a non-smooth relief on the surface, but this relief could be seen by phase contrast microscopy. And then you grow cells on, on that uh, cover slip. Uh, and uh, after embedding into the resin, this relief is actually imprinted on the surface of, of a um, resin block, meaning that you have the same orientation uh, marks in both in light electron microscopy, in light microscopy, and electron microscopy. So, if you have this grid on your dish and you identify a cell with some marker like GFP or any fluorescent marker, and then you can detect it, uh, I mean, in X, Y direction at least, and of course it would be beneficial if you can do it in Z positions as well, using phase contrast. And uh, on that image, you can see that there is there is a grid, uh, could, could be visible with a certain illumination. And when you overlay the grid with a phase contrast with a <clears throat> fluorescent picture, you can have pretty good uh, localization uh, of the uh, of your cells of the structure of interest. And uh, the next diagram uh, shows the, the full uh, sequence of events. It seems a bit complicated, uh, but actually it could be quite simple to explain because this part you already know. You have the cover slip with the grid where the cells are growing, and of course this cell should have some marker. Which is visible in uh, light electron in light uh, microscopy environments. It could be uh, fluorescent proteins. It could be the markers with antibodies. It could be anything which emits lights. And uh, then, uh, in a classic paper which published um, it was quite a long time ago, it was twenty years ago. Uh, the same uh, structure should be labeled so with, um, with markers for electron microscopy, which are electron dense. And then all that uh, arrangement is embedded into the standard uh, uh, electron microscopy protocol uh, with the uh, osmium, uh, heavy metal salts like uranium acetates, and uh, uh, it should be dehydrated and embedded into resin. And after that, that block could be cut in uh, uh, just sections or serial sections. And these serial sections then uh, co correlated with the uh, images you got from a petri dish. And actually, uh, this is just a general scheme, and some parts of this could be skipped, or something could be added. 
For example, this part could be skipped completely because you don't need, if, if you have structure big enough, uh, then of course you don't need to label it because you, you probably will recognize it even without labeling for electron microscopy. And uh, in this case, you just want to uh, uh, assess where, where in that position your structure is roughly and, uh, and then um, localize it based on, on some fiducial marks like, like plasma membrane or nucleus. And you can actually even measure the, the distance and then just uh, uh, deduct where your structure is. And if there is something there, then that's your structure. And also, uh, of course, it relates mostly for, for big, big things. Uh, you, you can't find uh, small vesicles, for example, in this, with this methodology because they this would be too much of uncertainty. And uh, that part as well could be modified because you have sections and sections could be labeled depending on the grids, depending on, the, on your sample, depending on the uh, antibodies and markers. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch a bit uh, about additional labeling. Next slide. Okay, come on. Yes. So this, this correlative light electron microscopy uh, in classic variant should be combined with immunotransmission electron microscopy, meaning that uh, the, the uh, structure which is labeled uh, for fluorescent marker um, to see it on, on light microscopy level should be labeled as well by something which is electron dense, uh, which would be like peroxidase DAB based markers in, in which you uh, apply special enzyme which converts uh, the uh, hydrogen peroxide in uh, oxygen radicals. And then this oxygen radicals makes the amino benzidine uh, in a uh, polymer structure, which uh, uh, attracts a lot of osmium and becomes dark like in this in these images and you can see this is the uh, labeling for collagen in, in, in the Golgi stack or uh, you can apply uh, very small gold and then try to make it bigger why small because uh, for pre-embedding pre-embedding meaning that every, every all labeling should be done before the embedding into the resin so it's not on the section it's inside it's on on a dish and for that, to, to, to be able to penetrate the surface of the cell, of course, you need to permeabilize it. And you can't make this permeabilization too much um, because um, then you destroy ultrastructure. So there's always a trade-off. And if you want to make ultrastructure still good, uh, you need to have these holes are very small. And for that, uh, meaning that this is mean, this means that uh, the gold particles they just can't go inside, meaning that you need to have small gold. But small gold you can't see an electron microscope because you have um, uh, the, the gold itself will mix will be, be masked by the background of the cell, meaning that you putting small gold inside like here, like 1.4 nanometer, and then you enhance it, uh, it's in special terms when you put some chemicals and then it increases the, the, it precipitates the metals on the surface of these particles and make them bigger. Uh, the problem, of course, that sometimes you have a lot of background depending on your sample, depending on your regions and so on. Uh, in post embedding things, in post embedding methodologies, you put your markers directly on the sections. So after the sample is embedded and cut with the very thin sections of 70 nanometers, uh, you just label the uh, <clears throat> sections themselves with antibodies. Uh, uh, this antibody should be, of course, conjugated with some marker. It could be, uh, it should be something electron dense, of course. Like the best thing is gold particles. And then you get, of course, the um, a quantifiable label. Uh, but uh, all that methodologies, they're not uh, without some problems. As you can see, these markers, these, these um, reagents which we use for uh, labeling uh, proteins and uh, other um, molecules on the surface of sections, they're quite big. Uh, immunoglobulin G and five fragments of the globulins, they're quite, quite long ones, so it's like 10 nanometer long length. And uh, the markers, uh, which are electron dense, like 10 nanometer goals, they, uh, they have this size, this, it's quite a big size. And if you conjugate uh, it to the, um, to the immunoglobulin G, uh, then of course you have a size of 20 nanometers already. 
and it's quite thing it's a quite big thing and if you can see that uh, <clears throat> If, you, if even if you label, if you don't need, don't have a problems with the permeabilization of cells for pre embedding, even with the post embedding uh, uh, methods, you you, you have a, a lot of a lot of problems, and that because most of because of these problems, most of antibodies which are working for uh, light microscopy pretty well, they very often I think I would estimate like probably seventy percent of them do not work well for electron microscopy. And that because of uh, first, if you can see that all sections, even ultra thin sections, they have a thickness. And uh, even cryo sections, with cryo sections, the problem is that the gold particles uh, of um, saying five nanometers, um, maybe even as small as two nanometers, they, they can't penetrate inside. So even if your antibody can go inside detect antigen to detect, detect antigen, the, the gold itself will not go inside. So it will stay on the surface and maybe washed away. Uh, meaning that actually uh, you, you're labeling only the two dimensional surface of a section. And uh, if you can imagine, as, as I said, that the 50 nanometer of sections can contain, uh, in, in this example, for example, about 10, uh, or uh, 11 uh, antigens, uh, and and uh, only one is exposed exposed on the surface. Meaning that if you label with it with antibody, then uh, you have a very low signal. Even if you have a lot of antigen, you don't have enough signal. And uh, what the solution of that problem with the correlative light electron microscopy is possible? You just do not use electron microscopy probes. And how, how you do that? Because you, of course you can see fluorescence at the uh, electron microscopy level, uh, because there are no detectors, you're using electrons, not photons. Um, it's quite easy, relatively, <laughs> that uh, actually what you do, you try to take the picture of the same, uh, of the same section, both in light and electron um, microscopy level. Uh, and th this, the, the main trick is to prepare your sample in a way that even in the section you still have fluorescence. And after that, you can combine these two images and in the end, you get location of protein of interest. You can, you can uh, <clears throat> deduct it uh, by the uh, registration of two images using the special um, fiducial markers that uh, I will talk about it later. And that is the publication uh, from 2011, which actually opened up and sum summarized the, all, me all the uh, met methodology itself uh, to allow people to repeat it. And it was used quite a lot all over the world already. And it's the standard methodology in Amble uh, lab for uh, electron microscopy. So the uh, on section, uh, Correlative AM flow workflow and since it consists of several steps, and I'll touch them in um, a bit later. But that, this is just an overview. So the first, uh, uh, the the requirement to preserve fluorescent protein like GFP in a, in a condition that it can emit, emit uh, uh, the signal still in the resin is to fix it in a special way, so called high pressure freezing. Um, then uh, this sample usually uh, freeze substituted. I, I'll talk about it later as well. And in, in the end, you get the block of the tissue, which is still fluorescent, and you can cut this tissue in a very thin sections. And that sections will be examined can be examined both in light microscopy, getting images. You can get stacks of images, and course, in a transmission electron microscope, where it, depending on the thickness of a section, you can have just flat sections, like, like two-dimensional pictures, or you can, if you have thick sections, you can even uh, acquire tomograms. So uh, let's talk about the first first step here, the, the, the fluorescence, um, the, the preservation of fluorescence, for the preservation of fluorescence, you need high pressure freezing fixation. Uh, just to uh, 
to remind you uh, from my previous lecture, I already was talking about freezing uh, as a method of fixation. And in standard freezing, as you can see, water molecules form a hexagonal uh, crystal structure. And that hexagonal crystal structure actually destroys a lot of biological uh, material inside the cell. Breaks membranes, it displaces proteins, dispose uh, a lot of things uh, from their places. And that is an example uh, where the chromatin uh, shows some uh, segregation pattern. And if you keep it in the frozen condition, it will show that there is crystalline ice. And that's not good. We don't want crystalline ice. Uh, the, the way to get around this is to stop the molecules to move around and uh, prevent them to moving to the nodes of this crystal structure. And that could be done by high pressure freezing when the very high pressure is applied first and then there is a very sharp drop of uh, temperature. And in this case, uh, molecules of water, they just do not have time to move to the nodes of crystal uh, hexagonal crystal of ice. This way, water preserves its uh, amorphous nature and forms amorphous ice. You have all the um, uh, most of biological structures preserved in their native condition. And after uh, uh, visualization, you can see the chromatin looks much better. It doesn't have any segregation artifacts. And if you put it in a frozen condition, still in, in a uh, cold cry microscope, uh, environment, then you don't don't see any crystal uh, structures with, with a diffraction. So uh, freeze substitution. If you just freeze your cell with uh, to, to form the amorphous size, of course you can go to the uh, way of uh, cryo correlative light electron microscopy. It's quite complicated. We don't have this methodology working yet, so I will not touch it for in my in my talk. And I'll talk about free substitution. And free substitution is a way to bring your uh, frozen, uh, uh, practically ideally uh, fixed sample into room temperature, which allows to use standard preparation techniques like uh, room temperature microtomes and room temperature electron microscopes. So what does it mean? Actually, it's based on very interesting feature of uh, the uh, organic solvents. Uh, at minus 90 degree, where you still do not have any hexagonal ice and your, your sample is still solid, uh, the acetone itself is liquid. So meaning that actually uh, second, that actually you, you what we can do, you can replace frozen water with organic solvents and this water is still in solid conditions and organic solvents in liquid conditions. And what you do, you're avoiding recrystallization of hexagonal uh, ice crystals. And in this way, if you add some uh, as well contraster into the uh, uh, free substitution medium, you can add a contrast to your sample. And what, what you achieve is that you don't have all this detrimental uh, sequence the detrimental uh, action of the slow diffusion of your fixity in your cell. The cell is frozen at once and you have your fixative uh, delivered at fro freeze frozen conditions uh, with organic solvents. And by this way as well, uh, if you keep your uh, contrasting uh, agents very, very low concentration, you can preserve even fluorescence. Of course, you can't use high concentrations of these heavy metals, but low concentra concentrations of urinal acetate, which produce quite nice ultrastructure, visible contrast, uh, they can it can preserve the fluorescence. Of course, if you have a lot of uh, urinal acetate, you'll have better structure, but less fluorescence and vice versa. So you need to be very careful about that. and. Uh, Small concentration that 0.1% gives you kind of the optimal in both worlds of uh, fluorescence proteins, uh, fluorescent preservation, and of course the preservation, the visibility and preservation of ultrastructure. So the next step, uh, of course, is to how to combine the, the light electron, the light uh, picture, and the uh, 
electron microscopy picture, and that is uh, called registration. When the same structures are put in, into the register, so from both ways, from both methods, they are the same. And uh, for that, uh, the most common uh, thing which especially uh, used in AMBL and, and uh, uh, used in the procedure of uh, Wanda Kulski uh, are the fluorescent uh, dots, fluorescent dots which, are, uh, which can have several fluorescent markers at once and as well they're visible in electron microscopy image. So in, in here you can see a fluorescent picture with uh, several dots uh, which are quite bright and if you look carefully these dots are visible uh, in the electron microscopy picture as well. And the arrangement is quite the same. So in, in this case, you need to just rotate images. And probably you can wrap them or, or a bit distort them to, to fit the best mathematical model possible. And after that, when you have these independent markers all aligned, you can align as well the um, uh, your fluorescent marker of interest and see what exactly it's labeling. And that is the image from uh, the software from our new Talos microscope. And uh, we're still working to make it uh, optimal. Uh, it's not, it's not in, um, because we've just been trained recently and with all these uh, problems with COVID, uh, we, we can uh, allow a lot of time uh, to, to, to be, to, to develop this, uh, to, to the, um, uh, working algorithm yet, but we are working on that, and I think it's possible in the future uh, to uh, employ this methodology uh, with, a, I think, good success. Uh, also, if even if this uh, um, procedure, if, if this software will not work well, there is there are other options. Uh, there are special free software called IC and the, with a uh, with a <clears throat> correlative plugin develop by uh, Perrine and uh, that was published 2017 and we were taught how to use this in, in, a, in a, uh, our EMBL course for correlative light microscopy and the beauty of it it has much more instruments to uh, to register in proper way with the proper models to uh, sorts of images so have a uh, still have a quite a road ahead of us, but uh, I think we'll get to, to it. So uh, this a bit uh, crowded image, but what it what it does is showing is showing you that uh, the cor correlative light electron microscopy can as well be combined with three dimensional volume uh, electron microscopy. So uh, in there you can see there is a, a diagram of tomography. So tomography, it can be used with a, uh, serial tomography could be used with a correlative light electron microscopy. Also serial block face imaging uh, is called three view. If you have correct registration, uh, another possibility is to have the um, array tomography. So it's the, where the sections are lying on, on the silicon wafers and they can be imaged with any way you do. You can image them with the fluorescence uh, microscopy. You can image with the scanning electron microscopy. So it, it's up uh, to, to what, what do you want? What, what information do you want to extract? And that diagram, uh, I think, was explained in uh, uh, the previous lecture from David about three-dimensional microscopy itself. So now I have a quite interesting uh, movie from the uh, uh, AMBLE course. I think I'll just start it and you'll enjoy because it actually explains uh, peculiarities and uh, it show, just shows you what is involved. Correlative light and electron microscopy methods, or CLEM methods, allow us to take advantage of the information we receive from the light microscope and combine it with the electron microscope to precisely localize a protein of interest within a tissue. Here we're going to take you step by step through an on-section CLEM technique that has been developed in the labs of John Briggs and Marco Caxonen. This method combines the good ultrastructural preservation given by high pressure freezing and free substitution and allows us to preserve the fluorescence in a methylcrylate resin. 
The advantage is, is that we can do the light microscopy on a thin section that has been placed on an electron microscopy grid. This gives us a very good resolution in Z and allows us to go directly from the light microscope to the electron microscope to do the imaging. This method has proven to work very well on several biological models, ranging from cultured cells to tissues. The limitations being the size of the specimen for good effective freezing, but also the level of the initial fluorescent signal. So depending on the sample you're working with, some steps may have to be adapted. In this example, uh, sorry. example we are using a monolayer of HeLa cells expressing a GFP tag protein that is found in the Golgi apparatus. In preparation for high pressure freezing, we grow the cells on a three millimeter sapphire disc that has been coated with a 10 nanometer layer of carbon. High pressure freezing is performed with small metal carriers where one side has a 300 micron well and the other side is flat. The carriers are first put into a petri dish on a piece of filter paper coated with hexadecene. First, we place one carrier with the flat side facing up into the high pressure freezing holder. The sapphire cover slip bearing the cells is then transferred cells face up onto the carrier. It is important at this stage that no air bubbles are introduced. A gold spacer is placed on top of the sapphire disc, followed by another metal carrier with the flat side facing the cells. The sandwich is finally tightly secured within the high pressure freezing holder and placed into the high pressure freezing machine for freezing. This apparatus first applies 2,100 bars of pressure onto the sample and then quickly freezes by a jet of liquid nitrogen. The cells are thus vitrified within 20 milliseconds. After freezing, the holder is promptly transferred to a container filled with liquid nitrogen where the carriers can be dislodged from the holder and stored in a small Eppendorf tube. For free substitution, we're using the Leica AFS2 machine plus the FSP unit. The machine is cooled down and the solutions are put into the machine to let them cool down before transferring the samples. Using a binocular, we transfer the carrier sandwich in an Eppendorf filled with liquid nitrogen and place it into the machine. We then separate the sapphire disc away from the carrier and the spacer ring and place it into the freeze substitution cocktail with the cells facing up. At this point, you should make sure the sapphire disc is laying flat in the cocktail and not at an angle. Once all sapphire discs are transferred, the FSP unit is attached and plugged into the machine with the syringe lined up and ready to go. The machine usually runs between five to seven days, depending on the free substitution protocol you choose. During the free substitution process, the samples are incubated with 0.1% urinal acetate and acetone. This percentage of UA is a compromise between obtaining a nicely stained sample without quenching the fluorescence. The initial incubation in the free substitution cocktail is an important one, and certain samples can benefit from lengthening or shortening this time period depending on how thick they are. For cell monolayers, we normally incubate them in the free substitution cocktail for nine hours. After this incubation period, the cells are rinsed with acetone, followed by a step-by-step -step infiltration with Loicryl HM20 resin. Once the blocks are polymerized, the holder is taken out and the blocks are removed and can be stored for months at room temperature in the dark until they are ready to be used. For the sectioning, we are using an ultra microtome and sectioning with an ultra 35 degree diamond knife. You can choose which thickness to section depending on your electron microscopy imaging strategy. For 2D imaging, we cut 70 nanometer thick sections and for 3D electron tomography, 300 nanometers. Sections are retrieved on a 200 mesh carbon coated copper grid. We like these grids particularly because they are stable and have an asymmetric mark in the center that can be used as a reference in the microscope and the likelihood of the structures of interest lying on the grid bar is minimal. 
Once collected, the grids are transferred to a box where they can be protected from light. The fluorescent signal is very sensitive and grids must be imaged within the same day to avoid bleaching. To perform the correlation, we use beads that can be seen both in the light microscope and the electron microscope. These are commercially available beads that are electron dense and fluorescent and can be used for this purpose. Here we use tetraspects that can be seen in the blue, green, red, and far red channels. These tetraspects can be bought in different sizes, but for this application, it's important to choose the smallest ones in order to increase the precision of the correlation. Here we incubate the grid with the sections facing down on a 10 microliter drop of tetraspec solution in PBS. The concentration of the bead solution is determined empirically prior to the experiment. As we will see later, we will aim for a dense enough distribution to detect dozens of beads on a single field of view at the electron microscope. After five minutes incubation, the fiducial beads are rinsed with distilled water. The grids are blotted with filter paper in between each washing step and placed back in the storage box. For imaging in the light microscope, we sandwich the grid between two glass cover slips so the grid is flat and as close to the objective lens as possible. First place a 30 microliter drop of water on the first cover slip and place the grid on top with the cells facing down. In order to avoid the formation of air bubbles, we pipette some water on top of the grid to wet the surface. We then put a thin layer of vacuum grease around the edge of the second cover slip and carefully place it on top of the grid. Close the sandwich, pressing very gently around the edges to spread the water. To mount the sandwich on the microscope, we insert it into a custom-made imaging chamber. For the light microscopy, we typically use a wide-field fluorescence microscope. For imaging, we put the imaging chamber onto the microscope stand. Using the 20x objective in the bright field mode, we retrieve the center of the grid, which contains the asymmetric mark for orientation. Switching to the channel of interest, we acquire an image with a very low excitation intensity and exposure in order to localize the cells of interest without bleaching out the signal. Next, we save the position of the cell and change the objective to one with a higher magnification. In this case, we chose a 100x oil objective with a 1.4 NA. We go back to the cell of interest and we focus on the beads using a channel that does not excite the fluorescent protein of interest and take an image. We then switch to the channel of the fluorescent protein of interest and take the image. To remove the grid from the cover slip sandwich, unscrew the chamber and open the two cover slips using a sharp scalpel. The grid, sections, and carbon film tend to stick to the surface of the cover slip, so it's important to treat it gently and remove it without damaging it. Place a drop of water onto the grid and carefully pipette up and down until the grid releases from the surface. Take the grid and blot off the excess liquid with a filter paper. The grid is then imaged in the electron microscope and we can use the asymmetric mark in the center to navigate to the cell of interest. Once we reach the cell, we acquire images at different magnifications to later be used for the correlation. A lower magnification can be used to locate enough fiducials for the correlation and a higher magnification for higher resolution images of the areas positive for fluorescence. 
For the correlation, we are using the IC software package and the EC Clem plugin. In the EM image, the fiducials will appear as dark electron dense spots, 100 nanometers in diameter, while in the light microscope image, they appear as diffraction limited spots, positive for the four channels. In this example, we can see green and red. We select corresponding beads by clicking on their center. It's important to use the same channel as the protein of interest to select the center of the beads to avoid shifts due to the chromatic aberration. After localizing three beads in both imaging modalities, the software is able to calculate the transformation. However, the more beads you click, the more precise the correlation will be. The software applies a similarity transformation that scales, rotates, and translates the fluorescent image to make it fit to the EM image. This results in a final image overlay where we can zoom in and appreciate which structures underlie the fluorescent signal. In this case, we see a clear representation of the Golgi apparatus. So that's, that's finished. Uh, I think you enjoyed that. And uh, I, I know all these people and they're really nice and they're so helping and this uh, advice so much to me. And uh, I highly recommend all the, the courses you can attend in, in Emble. Because it's a it's a just marvelous place. So uh, uh, the last thing uh, I need just to go to the second uh, to the last slide. This is just amazing development. I, I like it very much. What what it does it allows you to make high throughput ultrastructure screening of multiple samples in one go. Actually, if if you're developing something like especially in this case with yeast, you can have a lot of phenotypes. Uh, tens, even hundreds, and of course, if you try to, uh, uh, to to process them separately for EM, it will be an enormous task. Uh, but these guys, uh, Yuri Bukov and Wanda, and uh, uh, of course, uh, and John Briggs, uh, developed uh, a way of uh, coloring color bl uh, barcoding. Sorry, uh, what they do, they actually apply special dyes in different combinations for different strains of yeast and process, process everything in one go. So in one section, in one sample, you have tens of different combinations and you can have tens of different strains. And due to this uh, marvelous uh, methodology of CLEM, you actually can detect them precisely. And with a software on microscope, could be IC or could be the MAPS software, you actually can mark the areas like here to automated uh, acquisition of images. So you correlate to image to low modifications images from electron microscopy and light electron uh, light microscopy. Mark the zones for acquisition. Go home, and in the morning you have hundreds thousands of images of your strains uh, done in automatic mode. I think that is amazing. And that is the example uh, from a real, real case. So I think uh, that ends my lecture and my presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. So uh, it should be in chat. In chat, I don't have anything yet. Uh, so um, just waiting like two, three minutes if somebody have any questions. Alex, yeah, can I ask a question. You know, so the method that you showed there it was for sort of high pressure frozen samples, but if you want to correlate a structure in the fluorescence microscope that you've labeled with an antibody, uh, I guess that's more difficult. So can can you label in the light microscope with a, an antibody and a fluorescently conjugated second antibody and then fix and then do some like EPON and find the same structure? Thank you. In general, I think it's possible. Uh, the only thing, with, of course, with, with antibodies, uh, is to select the proper mark, the proper fluorescent uh, dye, right? We, which will, should preserve the fluorescence after the high pressure freezing. You, you can't you can't preserve fluorescence with the chemical fixation in most cases. 
No, I know, I know. But can you, could you localize the protein in the fluorescence microscope on your gridded cover slip and then take it into the EM and find the same structure, basically, without having the fluorescence? This is, how, what, what, this is actually what we do uh, yeah. with the first met method. Yeah. So uh, the first method is mostly relates to chemical, chemically fixed material. Yeah. So if you can, if you can preserve antigenicity of your sample with a mild chemical fixation and label them with antibody, and then you have location using this grid, you know, the grid on, on the cover slip. And of course you, you, you can locate the same thing uh, after embedding. Uh, the only thing to, to aware is of course uh, that uh, if you label it with antibodies, you need to per perforate membrane, meaning that the, the ultra structure will be not optimal. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you lose a bit of the structural integrity. Yeah, this is a trade-off. Uh, you, yeah. <laughs> you can't avoid it, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, the question from Carlin. Uh, pre presumably, you could stain a cell using DAB when embed in a resin and examine in EM. In the EM. In fact, I have done this. With one yeah. That that's the thing. With actually, this is was the. Uh, the classical method, <clears throat> which was published by, by Roman and uh, my father, because they use uh, DAB uh, reaction with with uh, uh, antibodies conjugated with hosphorylic peroxidase. Nowadays, it's a bit more versatile because actually you can use uh, so-called APIX, the ascorbate peroxidase, uh, which is quite small, could be conjugated, could be expressed uh, with this protein, which could conjugate with the Proton of interest and expressed in a, in a transfected cells, and uh, then you just add uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide DAB, and voila, you don't need even to perforate cell. So this is one of the methodologies which is very promising, but it depends very much on how successful your transfection will be, and uh, uh, will this label, if if you um, um, uh, transfect it would uh, change the behavior of protein. If you're talking about antibodies, uh, that's a bit more complicated because um, you know, it's not a lot of antibodies uh, nowadays, at least, uh, conjugated with host regular peroxidase, which are working well for EM. Uh, in my <laughs> early days, there was one company in France which produced perfect antibodies, but it went bust. Okay, um, if nobody have any other questions, uh, then I want to thank everybody for attending.